spotlighting Hawaii's leaders. We want to bring in Governor David E. Good morning, Mr. Mayor. Lieutenant Governor, good morning. Thanks so much for joining us. Mayor Derek Kawakami. Thank you so much, uh, Senator, for being here. Spotlighting the issues. Where is the virus right now in our community? How much is this overall going to cost the state? How are you responding to the community's concerns? Talk about the level of citations that you guys are writing. Spotlight Hawaii with Yanji Denise and Ryan Kalei Suji on the digital platforms of the Honolulu Star Advertiser. This episode of Spotlight Hawaii is brought to you by Long's Drugs. Well, aloha, and thanks for tuning in here on this Aloha Friday. I'm Ryan Kalesuji, joined by Yenji Denise, and this is Spotlight Hawaii on the digital platforms of the Honolulu Star Advertiser. This morning, we continue our spotlight on the upcoming election, this time focusing on the race for governor and the GOP ticket. That's right. We are welcoming former Lieutenant Governor Duke Iona, also a former deputy prosecutor, of course, later a judge. He is joining us live on the program this morning. He is running for governor on the Republican side. Uh, thank you so much for being here this morning. Oh, thank you for the opportunity. I, I'm looking forward to this. So I was doing, you know, just a little bit of research into the last time we had a, gov a Republican governor. And what's interesting is that when you and Linda Lingle uh, were together and, and running for office, you were the first Republican administration to win a second term. And you won by the largest margin of victory of any gubernatorial uh, race in the history of the state. So there was definitely a mandate, if you will, at that time. Uh, but it's been a while since we've had a Republican on the fifth floor. Why why do you think Hawaii is ready in this moment? Well, you know, it's, it's pretty eerie. Um, the political climate when we ran in 2002 is very similar uh, to where we are right now. You know, we we ran um, on a uh, two party system platform and also on other other issues. And I remember education was a big part of it. And but the political climate at that time was very similar in this respect. You had some city council members who were were actually convicted and went to jail as a result of uh, campaign spending um, violations. You also had a state representative who um, faced the same thing and I believe went to jail also. And likewise, what's happening right now, in fact, at a larger scale and a more intensified scale. So right now you have a, a police chief who, albeit not an elected uh, official, but nonetheless, uh, you know, a public official uh, right now in jail. But you do have an elected prosecutor who's indicted you just had a state senator who pled guilty and is uh, got sentenced to, I think, three and a half years in jail. You also have a state representative who I believe is going to be sentenced very shortly, all for, you know, abuse of campaign spending. And, you know, also in addition to what we had, you know, back in 2002, you have a, a political donor of the Democrat Party who um, has been known to give to if not everyone, but almost every single um Democrat candidate who had any significance in this state or any power in this state also being indicted. So it's the same kind of political climate. Uh, the issues like like in 2002 have been longstanding issues. They have been, haven't been addressed for, for decades and we're facing that right now. So I, I think the, the, you know, the climate is there. It's, it's prime. And um, I believe that the people will speak out. We've also had two and a half years of, um, of a shutdown in the state of Hawaii and, People forget, uh, Yanji and Ryan, that, you know, they, they, they say it was about the pandemic. But in reality, it's the policies uh, that were invoked by the administration and those in elected office that caused us to uh, have you know, businesses shut down, uh, that caused the schools to, to not be in session, that closed the parks, that shut down, you know, um, activities by our youth. So it was policies that were enacted and not the pandemic. They use that as a as the reason why, but it, it may have been the cause, but it wasn't the the effect and the reason why we had the policies uh, Im implemented. It was it was their decisions. They had options. They didn't have to close down. You know all these businesses. I mean, how do you justify right the um, um, having Costco and Target and Walmart um, remain open? You know at the scale and the uh, capacity that they're at, but yet a mom and pop sh um, shop that has maybe maybe 10 people at the most in their store at one time, but took all the precautions that were needed so that they would have tremendous social distancing, disinfecting everything, plexiglass up, et cetera. Why weren't they allowed to operate? It doesn't make any sense. It never made any sense to the people of Hawaii. And as such, you had this 
you know, tremendous, um, um, how can I put it, um, this, this, dismay and, and frustration. And let's not forget about the mandates, the, the vaccine mandates, as well as if you weren't vaccinated, you lost your job. And I think that was really a tipping point with many people. So for all of those reasons, I think we're right there where we need to be in regards to um, bringing a, or I guess you could say, um, um, identifying and, and, and having a two-party system. Let's talk a little bit about uh, some of the things that you just brought up with the pandemic and the leadership and those who were leading the state during this time. Uh, if you were in this position uh, as governor during the pandemic, when we saw many states and countries shutting down and, and different policies being enacted around the country, uh, what would you have done differently to navigate Hawaii during this time? Well, you know, 2020 is always great hindsight, right? So I don't want to second guess and seem like, you know, I'm just kind of, you know, being that kind of Monday morning quarterback. But I do know that as we learned more about the uh, the virus and where we were going and also taking lessons from other states. And this is where I think it got too political. Um, the blue states did this and the red states did that. I, I think that was... Uh, something that was very distracting and something that this state followed and it shouldn't have followed. Um, but obviously, you know, and, and I guess you could say this is not Monday morning quarterbacking because I, I was a big part of it. Um, I had to mentor my grandson, my, my six-year-old grandson for that entire year that uh, they shut down the schools. And I went through that and I saw exactly the effect that it had, not only on my grandson, but the other students in his class, as well as the teacher herself. And I got to give props to that teacher. She was tremendous. Um, I, 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 I wish I had the, half the patience she had. I wish I had half the energy that she had. I wish I had half the passion she had in regards to making sure that her students um, got what they needed. But that all, again, if, if you were a part of it, you would have known that that was just the wrong policy. It was, it was entirely wrong to shut down our schools and not have our children back in the classroom. Now, obviously, you know, you had, you had people on both sides of that issue, but I think there was enough room and there was enough time um, to basically take care of the concerns of everybody. So a lot of schools understood after a while how to go online and there were students that wanted to stay online and you could have accommodated them. And then obviously masking was an option and it still, and it still should be an option. Personally, I, I don't believe that masks should be mandated. Um, and I think it's in the right spot right now where it's, it's optional and children can go with or without a mask. But I, I definitely would not have um, shut down our, our, our entire state as long uh, as it was. I, I definitely would not have you know, suspended the, uh, the access to information um, as well as um, shut down on the, uh, the, the I should say, they, they basically did shut down the Sunshine Law and, and things of that nature. So um, it would have been much more open, obviously, and I definitely, definitely would not have mandated vaccines and the, um, the dismissal of employees, public employees, who did not want to get the vaccines. And I can expand on that if you want to, but um, that's some of the areas that I would have done differently. Well, our state is reopened now and our economy is recovering. The tourists are coming back in droves. What are your thoughts on managing tourism? It's something we talk about a lot on this program. There's a lot of frustration with Kama'aina who feel like they don't have access to the places that are near and dear to them. On the other side, obviously, it's the economic engine of our state. So how many tourists do you think is appropriate for Hawaii and, and how do we achieve that balance? Good question. And, you know, I... I, I, I said uh, in response to that in some other forums, I said, you have to have a better context of what you mean by that in regards to limiting tourists. And when I say that, I mean, okay, so how do we get that number? Okay, how, what's that number? What is the right number? How do you get to that? Secondly, then how do you control it? I mean, you're saying limiting. So do we do it by way of saying, okay, we only take X amount of, uh, when you get that number, X amount of people via the, the planes and boats, or do we do it by hotels and say, okay, hotels, you shut down after X amount. Then we have to go to the neighbor islands. But what's overbroad, what's, what's, I guess, put this in proper context, what's, what's really overseeing all of this is whether or not all of this is legal, whether you really can have a cap, uh, a number cap on travel uh, within the United States and, of course, abroad uh, from international destinations. So... All of that has to be discussed. I, I think, I mean, if you really want that to be, if that's something that's serious, then it's, it has to be a broader context. But let me just put it this way. I, I'm, I'm, really, I'm really excited about the, uh, 
the, the concept of management and where HTA is going in regards to that. And, and really the entire industry, um, it's more culturally based. It's, it's more, I guess you could say more defined in regards to what type of tourists we want um, to, I guess you could say market to come to Hawaii. And of course the, the education that is needed to make sure that when the tourists do come, that they understand, you know, where we're at in regards to our resources and how precious it is. I think if there's anything that the pandemic, there were some things that came out of the pandemic that actually, I think, benefited us as a state. One of them was the fact that we kind of woke up and when we were allowed to go to the beaches, we said, wow, well, they're pristine and the water's clean and our trails are nice. And, you know, that, that was a, that was a positive. And I think that was the, I guess the, the, uh, the element that, that brought or sparked uh, this this new awakening to um, to the residents of Hawaii regarding our resources, because you know part of this also is us being good stewards, and and I'm not saying that everybody is not a good steward, but I think we had a, a large percentage in Hawaii that could have been much better stewards of our of our natural environment, you know, and this kind of woke us up, and now we see it, and so I like that I like that direction that we're going. Now there's controversy in regards to. Um, you know, who's going to be that agency that's going to market the uh, the tourism and, and and embark on this new vision that HDA has. And I'll leave that to that process. But all I can say is that I, I think it's a good way to go. I think this is much better than saying, oh, we're going to limit tourist, tourism and, you know, at a certain amount. Um, because like I said, the, the overriding or the overarching um, theme behind all of that is whether or not it's legal. And I don't think we need to get into that at this point in time. One of the things that we are seeing uh, become more popular with many of the counties is charging fees to certain areas mm -hmm. to access, like going up Diamond Head or to Hanama Bay or on the other islands as well. They have implemented this uh, fee, if you will, to experience some of the attractions that see a lot of foot traffic from tourists. Is that something that you would be in favor of, is expanding some of those fees or seeing more of those on, at different destinations within the state? You know, I, that's a good question, Ryan. I think that's something that we have to be very cautious about and always evaluate because you tack on too many fees. Um, right now, as you know, the uh, the counties have an opportunity to to, um, to impose a TAT on, on our visitors. And if you saw that recent um, poll that was taken or, yeah, survey, I guess it was, that was taken of, our tour, of tourists that have been to Hawaii recently, you saw that one in five says, well, I'm not coming back. I'm not going to come back within the next five years. And that's a result. And, and I guess the main reason, one of the biggest reasons they gave was because of the expense. And, and that's a part of it. So I, I understand. I think it's needed uh, as long as the money also is going to what we believe is the, the maintenance and the upkeep of our trails and our parks and our beaches, et cetera. Um, as long as that's, that is, you know, we're, we're very, very strict on that. And we're, we're doing that part of it um, the way it should be. But also, like I said, being very cautious in how we do it, how much we charge and, you know, exactly where that money is going. So it has to be constant. You know, we have to constantly monitor it. We have to uh, constantly uh, good oversight over it. But more importantly, we got to we got to measure that that uh, feedback that we're getting from our visitors and, and how they're feeling about whether or not we're taking advantage of them as that, you know, just that tax machine, because. You know, I've, I've heard our legislators far too often, and I don't know if it's because of arrogance or what. But, you know, I, I hear them publicly speaking and say, well, we'll tax the tourists. We'll just tax the tourists because, you know, they can pay for it and they hear it. And whether they think they can vote or they can't vote, I do. They, I, I do know from my perspective, they do vote. And they vote with their feet. And there's other destinations out there that have um, very similar um, amenities that Hawaii has. But I still say Hawaii is unique and it's all because of our people and that spirit of the law. I want to ask you about affordable housing. It is the number one issue for so many voters, uh, but it is something that is so complicated. What do mm. you think on the state level that the governor specifically, the governor's office can do to help with the affordable housing crisis? Uh, another good question and, and uh, comment to that by you, Yanji. And you're right. Um, let me just start with this. It's, you know, when we say affordable, we all have a different definition of affordable, right? For you, affordable may mean this. For somebody else, it may mean this. When it comes to housing, there's various types of housing that we need. So the first thing you need to identify is the fact that we have a shortage of housing. So we need to build that supply up. And of course, when you talk to 
um, the contractors and the developers and everybody that's involved in the building industry, they're going to tell you it's all about government regulations that are driving up the cost. And of course, in a lot of ways, suppressing um, the building and getting the supply up in regards to housing. So we need to not just assess, not just to review. We know where the where the um, where the bottleneck is. And last night when I was asked that question about what I would do immediately in regards to government regulations, I said, eliminate the land use commission. I, I really believe that that's something that's been discussed for a while. It's something that people have thought about, but there's been no political will to really take action on that. Because I think when it comes to zoning and how we preserve our, you know, our conservation of land and our agricultural land and our urban, urban land and our rural land, that the counties have the, the mechanism and the process to do that. But more importantly, because of how we are an island state, it's more conducive to having local rule determine zoning uh, questions. And you take away that top layer on the state level, and it just makes it that much easier for developers and, and um, contractors to, um, to provide the homes that we need. You have projects that have been out there for years. I mean, uh, Cole Peely and I think Coral Ridge are good examples of that, where you're going to have probably 20,000-plus 20, 20, units between them being built but it's taken so long to just get, get the thing going. So, and it's all, when you go back and you look at what, what took so long, contested case hearings, lawsuits, government regulations in regards to entitlements. In other words, you know, sewers and roads and structures and parks and you name it, all of that. So that's what we need. I need to do as, as governor is make sure that one is a priority. Um, I, I think you, you'll hear some experts or to say some people who are in the industry say that, that, you know, government's never made it a priority to build homes. I mean, now they are, but it's taken a long time, but I want to make sure that we continue to make it a priority. And then second, not have any more regulations that are driving up the cost of, uh, of building homes. And like I said, also align um, the regulations between the state and the county. And if that means eliminating the land use commission, then I'm all for it. Let's do it. I'm, I'm ready to pull the trigger on that. You know, we could talk for affordable housing for the entire show because it is such a broad topic that covers so many right. things. Uh, but we want to move on because there's a lot of different other uh, issues happening. One of the issues that has been brought up, of course, recently making a lot of headlines is what's happening at Red Hill uh, and the military's response and what we've learned as a state overall through this process of the defeeling of the facility. But it also brings up a larger question about the state's relationship with the military moving mm -hmm. forward. And there are a number of military leases that are up for renegotiation, and some are saying that it is time that the state reexamine its relationship with the military and if those leases should continue on. Uh, if you are elected governor, how would you manage that relationship? And do you believe that these military leases uh, that the state is engaged in should continue on with yeah. uh, these different areas? You know, the military has done uh, has been a tremendous benefit for the state of Hawaii. So let's remember that we've never had, we've not always had a great relationship with the uh, military. We can go back in history and see why. And I think it's um, uh, a lot of that has has merit in regards to why the relationships have been strained. But over the years, it's become much better. And like I said, the military has been a tremendous benefit to the people in the state of Hawaii. They provide a lot of jobs, a, a lot of civil service jobs for us. And they're a big employer. So I don't want to forget that. So it's not about, you know, using it as, as leverage to, to get what we need, which some other candidates have said. We should use that as leverage and, you know, make the military do what it needs to do. Um, no, I, I want to do what's best for Hawaii. And I want to do what's best for America. We are a part of uh, the United States and, and the military is a big part of, uh, of our infrastructure when it comes to, you know, us as a, as a country or we as a country and, and the greatness that we have. So I, I, I understand, um, you know, that we can use it as leverage. Um, it may come to fruition that maybe I might have to do that to a certain extent. But I don't want to say at this point in time that I'm going to use that solely as leverage so that we can get what, need, what needs to be done. What's happening at Red Hill is is um, is a tragedy. It's it's something that obviously is an emergency. It needs to be handled as expeditiously as it can, but also being a realist and understanding okay what needs to be done and how long it's going to take. Now, whether or not I you know I was asked this question about whether I believe the what the military is reporting is true, you know I, I can only go on what I'm I'm hearing from the um, um, from the from the the news uh, reports and what I'm reading and, and hearing from other people. I, I, you know, I, I know a lot of the reports are public and, and I can read them, but I think what you really need to do, and this is why, you know, be when first thing is governor, what I need to do is, 
is Anita Hull with our Department of Health and the people who have been involved in it, and, and get from them a firsthand perspective is exactly what's going on at Red Hill. And just make sure that uh, we keep the pressure on and that we, you know, we, we continue to monitor it and obviously get the results that we, we think is best for the state of Hawaii. I see right now that we're, we have um, a, um, a segment of our, our, our health department who's saying that this report that was given is just not adequate. It's, it's um, actually, they called it uh, disgraceful. And um, whether that's true or not, I, I take it at face value for what uh, they've said. But as governor, you're in a different position. And of course, you have to deal with both sides. So, but I definitely will keep the pressure on. I definitely will make this, a, it, it will be at the top of the, uh, the list in regards to things that we do as administration. The Department of Health, I don't think, uh, you know, there's, there's many things that may have gone wrong in regards to how we got to this place at Red Hill. But that's all behind of us. We have to look forward now in regards to what we're going to do and how we're going to, like I said, resolve this. But it's something that has to be done as expeditiously as we can and right now because it is an emergency and it is affecting the, the health and safety of our, our people. You know, there's a national conversation right now at the forefront regarding guns, and I'm interested to get your thoughts on the current gun laws in Hawaii. There's a recent Supreme Court decision that could greatly alter that and the ability of people to perhaps conceal and carry in this state. How do you feel about that? Um, and, and what is your stance on that, particularly given that you have a, a law enforcement background, you know, as a prosecutor mm -hmm. and a judge? You know, I've uh, to be consistent for the record, I've always felt that our, our gun laws prior to this Supreme Court decision was was adequate. Uh, it was efficient and it was doing its job in regards to keeping our people um, safe. And, and that for me, and, and as governor, that would be the number one concern that our, our residents are safe. Now, the recent Supreme Court decision touched upon one aspect of our, our gun laws, and that was the permit to carry. I, I believe in the, in the Constitution. I believe in the Second Amendment. I, I believe that this, what this um, latest Supreme Court ruling does, it does, it does put a little, <clears throat> it does, I guess it does call into question how the permits were being granted. And so that law obviously has to be um, amended or that portion of the law has to be amended. And I think right now the counties as well as the state um, are trying to, um, I guess, come to some kind of agreement in regards to what those amendments need to be. So as governor, I, I can only you know um, react to legislation. I, I, I can submit legislation like anybody else can but I don't create the legislation. So I'm going to have to monitor what the, uh, what the legislators do with this, um, this portion of our gun laws. And of course, I want to make sure that it's not overreaching. In other words, it's not unconstitutional uh, for our Second Amendment. But at the same time, I think first and foremost, I want to make sure that it's, it's uh, protecting the safety or it's, it's, it's protecting the safety of our, our citizens in regards to uh, gun control and, and gun use. You know, in speaking about the relationship with the legislature, if you were elected to this office, you know, there would obviously be a, a contrast with uh, Republicans maybe controlling uh, in the governorship and then the legislative body, which is surely likely to once again be dominated by the Democrats. Uh, if you could explain how you would imagine being able to collaborate and work on some of these things, knowing that you guys, you know, both parties have vastly different viewpoints on a number of topics. How would you be able to work with the legislature that is dominated by the Democrats in a situation where you uh, are leading the Republicans uh, in this office of being the governor? Yeah, I think this is, again, uh, this this highlights the, um, the difference between myself and all the other candidates in regards to uh, both on the Republican side and, and the Democrat side. I served as lieutenant governor for eight years with Governor Lingle. Uh, we were the minority, <clears throat> excuse me, party at that time. And I got firsthand, I guess you could say, experience and knowledge and, of course, wisdom in regards to how, you know, how to deal with that. And, you know, they talked about this. <clears throat> excuse me again. Um, they, um, they talked about this relationship that the governor and the lieutenant governor have. And I got to say, um, the relationship between myself and, and Governor Lingo has been unmatched in regards to all other administrations. And I say that. I say that not only with um, with pride and humility, but I also think it's factual. I don't think you'll ever see there was any other administration where the lieutenant governor and the governor worked together so closely. She made me a part of her administration. She did what the Constitution mandates with the lieutenant governor. That is to be ready uh, and able 
uh, to become governor if anything should happen to, to the governor uh, during her term or his term in, in office. And it's exactly what I was I was tasked, I mean, what I was trained and, and basically I have the ability and the skills to do. And like I said, first and foremost, the wisdom. So that happened for eight years, but also my, you know, my experience as a judge, I mean, as a judge, we're collaborative. Um, we have to be inclusive. We have to be impartial. We have to be objective. And in many instances, because we are conducting what we call, you know, settlement conferences and trying to bring parties together to compromise, that, that's, a, that's a natural um, skill and talent that I have uh, in regards to what we have to do from a legislative standpoint. Now, with the legislature, I, I think it's pretty obvious. Um, first of all, it, isn't, aren't you supposed to work together no matter what? And so for me, it's, it's not about a political party. It's not about political ideology. It's about what's best for the people of Hawaii. And, and that's how it should be. And, and that's how it should be approached in, for legislation, for policy, for anything that we do as elected public officials. We're public servants. We serve the public. We don't serve our party. We don't serve an ideology. We serve what's best for the people of Hawaii. So I, I don't see any problems in dealing with the legislature as long as we can agree on that. And I think we can. Because let me just highlight one thing, too. So Governor Lingo came in. You're right. She was the minority. We came in. And, of course, we, we had some things that we wanted to get done. Um, you can say it was a Republican ideology. I don't think it was. I think it was for what's best for the people of Hawaii. And if you recall, one of the many initiatives that she did that is still here today, and, in fact, is uh, the Democrats will say, well, this is – this is our, you know, this is our shining star, but really it started with Governor Lingo is the Hawaii Clean Energy Initiative. That's what started by Governor Lingo. And it continues today where, in fact, today, the Hawaii Clean Energy Initiative has a little different objective to it. They want to be completely renewable, 100% renewable energy by the year 2045. When that initiative first started, I thought it was much more realistic much more objective because we wanted to be not only have more renewable energy um, generating our energy, but also to be just efficient, whether it be retrofitting, changing light bulbs, uh, uh, appliances that were, you know, that, that were energy efficient. That, that was the whole goal of, uh, of that initial uh, the initiative, knowing full well that it would obviously evolve. Um, you know, we kept it to what I thought were very realistic goals and, um, of course, other administrations came in, and here we are where we are today. But that was an initiative from Governor Lingo, bipartisan support, and also with the federal government, and it's still here today. So I, I use that as, a, as Exhibit A in regards to, yeah, can I work with the legislature? Absolutely. They know that they need me. I know that they need uh, them. I need them. And so we work accordingly for the benefit of the people of Hawaii. The people of Hawaii, given your past experience, are very familiar with you. But, you know, we are already out of time. It goes so fast. But what do you wish that people knew about you on a personal level when they're making that decision at the ballot box or perhaps in their home now that the ballots are actually out? Uh, what do you wish that they knew about you on a personal level as they make this decision? You know, I'm in a, in a season of life right now that, that is very comfortable for me and my and my wife, um, we have eight uh, grandchildren and we love them dearly. They go from ages nine to, to the newborn. And we are a very integral part of uh, their lives. They're a very integral part of our lives as well as our children's lives. And that's been the focal point of, uh, for my wife and I for the last nine years. And, you know, I, I want people to know that for me, the future is now and because of my grandchildren. And, you know, it's, I'm not running simply because of that. And that's not why I got in the race so late. I mean, it's many, many things. And it was a difficult choice to get into this race because of what I just told you. Um, because, you know, being that grandfather for my for my grandchildren, they call me Tutu Man. So being that Tutu Man for them was, uh, was for me, it was a vocation right there in and of itself. I mean, the rest of my life can be dedicated to them and doing the best that I can for them. And also some other projects that I was working on in regards with, uh, with the DOE and and, and teaching um, uh, uh, new leaders, et cetera. But, you know, um, I, I want people to know that I'm, I'm with them every step of the way in regards to where we've been in the last 12 years, where we are now and what we've been through for the past two and a half years. And, and I, I feel the pain, I feel the frustration, and I know exactly um, what we've all gone through. I feel more in tune with the, um, with the people of Hawaii simply because of the of where my life has been in the last eight years um, and, and what I've been doing for the last eight years. So uh, it's, it's really being in step with, with, the, with the people of Hawaii and, and, um, and where we're going as a state. And I want to see us to be really what we can 
you know, many of these issues, like I said, are longstanding issues. It didn't have to get this way and it doesn't have to be this way. We can do much better. And um, I'm hoping that people will see that. They'll understand why we need a two-party system, why electing a Republican as a governor at this point in time would be a huge statement uh, to Hawaii and, and everybody in this state that we, we obviously need to be more transparent. We need to have more civil discussion because I really think in a lot of respects, the spirit of Aloha is no longer here. It's kind of dissipating, and we have to bring that back um, to state government and into the, the fifth floor. So I thank you, Ryan and Yanji, for this opportunity. And for the people listening, thank you very much for your attention and your time. And, yeah, get those ballots out. And uh, don't forget to vote Republican and vote for that first person on, on the Republican <laughs> ticket, which is Duke Guyana. One of the benefits of having an A is in last name, no doubt. <laughs> Former Lieutenant Governor and candidate thank for you. Governor Duke Iona, thank you so much for joining us this morning. Uh, we look forward to future conversations as well. Thank you. Mahalo. I appreciate it. Aloha. Aloha. Interesting to hear from him, Ryan, and really making the case for a Republican governor throughout, drawing parallels to the last time he was on the fifth floor with Lieutenant, uh, with then Governor Linda Lingle, saying that there are a lot of parallels between that time and now, uh, corruption cases that were at the forefront then, corruption cases, of course, at the forefront now, and really saying that it's a time for a, what he is calling a more balanced system of government, and he thinks that can be achieved by having two parties uh, in strong numbers at the state at the state level. Yeah, interesting to get his thoughts on some of the issues that we've been talking about on this show with many of the leaders, uh, especially during what we saw during COVID-19. Of course, uh, the former lieutenant governor saying that the regulations were just simply too strict, uh, that he wouldn't have imposed some of the things that we did see from the current administration in terms of lockdowns and shutdowns, the length of time, uh, vaccine verifications, and also uh, just the overall mandates that we also saw in schools. So the, lieutenant, the former lieutenant governor really distancing himself from that, saying that there should have been uh, more openness in the, the allowance of businesses to be able to operate during that time. And so really drawing a line in the sand in the distinction of how he would have handled things during the pandemic. We also got to hear a little bit more about his thoughts on affordable housing, as well as the relationship with the military. Yeah, that was very interesting. Um, he really sounded different than a lot of folks we've heard from uh, when it comes to the military saying, you know, highlighting how much the military has done for the state economically and tying us back to the broader mission of keeping the country safe and what a strategic hub, of course, Hawaii is for uh, Pacific Command and for the broader military uh, worldwide. So saying that really when it comes to renewing those leases that you have to keep that perspective in mind as well. Um, also interested, as you pointed out on affordable housing, this idea of completely scrapping the land use commission. He's saying that there is far too much red tape when it comes to developing new housing in Hawaii. And so he would get rid of that agency entirely to try to expedite the you know building process. Yeah, we've heard a lot of different uh, thoughts and ideas uh, from Duke Iona. And we encourage all of you to go back and watch this interview if you miss any part. We also, uh, just for notice, have also spoke to Heidi Suniyoshi, who is another candidate on the GOP ticket. We've also extended the invitation to fellow candidate BJ Penn to appear on the show. He has unfortunately uh, not been able to secure a date with us. And so uh, we hope to speak to him at some point, but we just would like to note that we have extended the invitation, but have not yet been able to get him confirmed to be on this program, but should be an interesting primary season as we head into this uh, election coming up in just a few weeks. Yeah, good to know that that invitation is open and we are still hopeful that he will join us at some point before August 13th. On Monday, we have a guest who's never been on before. That is the new chief of police for the city and county of Honolulu, Joe Logan. He'll be joining us. Uh, very interested to get his impression now that he's had a few weeks on the job. Uh, what are his priorities? You know, we heard a lot, of course, in the lead up to his hiring about the needs of the department, about how many officers we are short and just the morale issues, of course, coming off the Kealoha case and all that that has brought with it, having an interim chief for so long and the sort of disappointment in the mayor of how long that process took, what are his priorities and uh, where does he see this department going? We're going to have a very interesting conversation with Chief Logan on Monday. We do hope to see you then. We'll take care. Have a great weekend. Aloha. This episode of Spotlight Hawaii is brought to you by Long's Drugs.